do then P1. P1, whenever you're ready. Hello, am I audible? All right. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Democracy is an imperfect process, especially when it comes to controversial policy that ends up having a lot of swing among legislators that end up screwing over millions of the population because they weren't able to account for specific factors that the public would have wanted to know. This may be, for instance, in France, when it came to the carbon tax that was imposed in 2018, which led to massive outcry coming from individuals because legislators didn't understand the socioeconomic conditions as a result of the carbon tax, which meant that millions were unable to use energy and other examples that I will illustrate later. A couple of bits of setup, six parts. One, what exactly is this Citizens Assembly going to look like? So this is going to be a group of, as the info slide states, 150 different people uh, who are clustered from different regions from that country and different cities, all going to craft and design policy and form a bill. So this is going to be similar to what legislators do, but it comes from the general public. It will also go through a specific approval process of once the bill has specifically been designed, it will be passed through Congress for a final review for it to be later on to be passed we imagine that this assembly is going to be not done for like in one instance it's probably going to be a series of different discussions as we would imagine that controversial policies would take lots of time and effort to build meetings around etc second of all i just want to characterize and prevent any weird notions of what exactly these citizens are going to look like so we would imagine that as per the info slide, it's going to be an impartial actor. So we're going to fact and double check if whether or not that person has a specific conflict of interest. So obviously, when it comes to climate policy, we are not going to get a citizen that works in oil because we recognize that there's a deep bias that that oil worker has in designing a climate policy, for instance. Second of all, we would give them specialist advice that is generally objective. So you'd give them information in the form of, for instance, like criminal justice policy, data on recidivism. We would also talk about the specific energy outcomes that would come as a result of the existence of building a solar panel in the instance where that does become controversial. We'd also involve a variety of experts that come not just to environmentals and climate policy or like a criminal justice person in criminal justice policy, but also civil society groups, maybe economists that have their own particular takes on this. We would, If ever there comes a normative assessment on these policies, we would have uh, like multiple different experts that are able to show both sides of the house. And the last thing that I want to note here is that we think that the state has an incentive to make this incredibly transparent, similar to how we would, for instance, uh, like be able to publicize, make meetings, for instance, of how legislators would discuss uh, making policy because they have an incentive to want to make it as accessible for the public to make sure that their interests are catered to and not have it be a backdoor process. I, I assume that it's very similar to jury duty in that respect. Oh yeah, the last thing that I want to characterize is what specifically controversial is because there's a distinction between like controversial and non-controversial policy. We would just characterize it as just if oftentimes it leads to like swing decisions where it's hard to form a particular majority, that's where it, the controversy would start and that's where the policy would uh, like actually create the impetus for a citizen assembly. First argument for general democracy. We think that it's important that specifically you have conceptions of policy that are designed by these citizens. Why? For two reasons. First, we think that there is no such thing as an a priori conception of what is good policy because oftentimes it involves a lot of trade-offs. For instance, climate policy sometimes has to force you to trade off between the environment and some form of economic uh, conditions because you're going to have like a carbon tax that could hurt people. Same goes with criminal justice policy. If you want to do things like reduce the sentences of particular criminals for a specific crime, then that would also like counteract the effect of probably getting retribution because you are putting them in less time in jail. The second reason why it's important to have this is because they know that policies directly affect the lives of a lot of these individuals, right? Like imposing a carbon tax would specifically impact the purchasing power of these individuals. Sending a person in jail, for instance, also affects like their public safety because they know that you know a criminal could get let loose if so far as they don't believe in the criminal justice policy. The problem in the status quo is that currently representation is impossible because number one, legislators oftentimes have absolutes and short 
short-termist power because they often cater to three to four year electoral incentives which don't actually represent the maximal goods that individuals want to cater to. Second of all, oftentimes legislators tend to be tainted by political action committees that poison and end up making controversial policy a lot worse for the vast majority of people. Take a look at, for instance, in the United States, the Na like National Rifle Association is always able to hijack the Republican Party in terms of their legislators and make sure that gun reform is as weak as possible despite 90% of the population wanting to have like licensure for guns. Right? Why do we think, and I assume that opposition side is going to say this, why are existing mechanisms of the public trying to intervene insufficient? We think that the problem is that the way how the public attempts to ameliorate this is currently inaccessible and politically unstable. Because what are the other things that they could do? They could try to protest. But we think that that's bad because oftentimes, number one, sometimes the protests don't reach the necessary tipping point of critical mass for legislators to want to care. Number two, sometimes it ends up being disruptive and harm people because a form of means by which they're able to protest comes in the form of distrusting legislation. Like for instance, if there is a particular uh, code in like the like in the way how police reform works, like for instance, stop and frisk policy, they would start like harassing policemen as a result as a means of protest against them, which is what Black Lives Matter is doing, but oftentimes lead to counterproductive outcomes, such as leading to more violence for a lot of these people. But second of all, you could also engage in things like counter lobbying, which we would assume is an incredibly expensive process. They would have to fight the NRA with their billions of dollars, which is something that the people currently don't have. We think that this is the comparative on the R side is the best means of representation because you're able to raise your concerns. You're able to bring up your lived experiences and factor for all of these different lived uh, like perspectives as a result of you holistically understanding from the data that you're given, given that you don't have any uh, other uh, influence to make and design policy that aggregates the preferences of everyone else. Even if we concede that this could lead to bad policy, which I'll argue later I said that this won't be the case, we think that this is print in principle beneficial because it aggregates the preference of the individuals, directly affects the lives of these people, regardless of whether or not the, it, the argument's independent of any like pragmatic outcome here. Moving on to the second argument for why you get actually better policy. We think that, as I mentioned, there's limitation to legislators because of oftentimes their elites versus lived experiences of people. It doesn't like, uh, like translate to each other. There are short term incentives plus the fact that there's a conflict of interest, which oftentimes means that there's a tendency for specific legislators to over optimize for one specific value that may come at the expense of harming others, right? So this may come in the form of the early example that you talk about in terms of a carbon tax. The thing that I want to preempt here is that how come we can't make replacement of direct democracy instead of a citizen assembly, right? Because I'm assuming the third side is going to say is that why can't we just have all of this be put under a vote? There are two reasons to suggest this. The first one and the most obvious is that not all controver like policy is controversial, so you still need legislators on their side. So you can't have a direct democracy for everything. But second of all, we think that there's a pernicious harm that direct democracy sometimes pause because oftentimes there's media polarization because Fox News, in the effort of trying to not get a uh, gun reform, is going to taint and poison the minds of individuals, making everyone impartial and making the perception of information a lot worse because now they're going to be game theoretical incentives to want to make people biased in a particular way. Oftentimes, controversial po policy tends to be incredibly polarizing for a lot of the individuals, making it harder. The difference is that under our side is that when you're able to meet them in that citizen assembly, when you're able to talk with them, it becomes more down to earth. And it's not actually, and they're able to sift through that information with a lot more clarity, given that they're not tainted behind the guise of the computer screen of trying to understand that information with each other, because discourse is a lot greater when you're literally beside each other in that assembly as a result. So we think that you create better policy, one that factors in multiple different outcomes uh, that probably leads to like worse in crime, better environment, and all, one that doesn't harm people at that point. For those reasons, Affirm. We thank the speaker for their fine speech. O one, whenever you're ready. Hi, just checking. I'm audible. Not unclear. Cool. Thank you. 
I'm going to explain three things in this speech. Firstly, principally, we'll explain why this is an illegitimate form of policy making. Secondly, we'll explain why these policies are likely to make particularly bad decisions about policy. And thirdly, we'll explain that even when they do make the decision, buy into these policies will be terrible. Firstly, a few notes of setup. The first thing that I want to note in setup is just that we are willing to uh, agree with the affirmative team that uh, this body is likely to have quite a lot of power. But the note that I'd make here is that the reason this is quite uncontentious is just that the scale of harm, the, the, the harms and benefits of both sides in this debate sort of scale with the degree of power that it has. Uh, this this is just a debate about to the degree they do have power, is that power good or bad? The second note I want to make in setup is importantly, this policy will only take place in situations where governments are already considering the kinds of law reforms that the motion specifies. Uh, and so, and the sort of structural reason why that is true is just that uh, the government has to appoint the body to make the decision about law reform. It's unlikely that the, that the, pol that the body gets convened without the consent of the government. Uh, and so that means that this team can't claim any additional capital for changing these policies. It relies on the government like appointing the body. That means it is only applicable in those kinds of situations. Thirdly, then, given that characterization, we think the comparative uh, in this debate is likely to be three things. First of all, we support the regular mechanisms of lawmaking and policy making that happen today. Second of all, we think in specific instances and where it's appropriate, we're happy to support things like referenda and specific polling on particularly contentious policy that's like maybe like constitutionally uh, like constitutionally uh, contentious. Uh, but thirdly, we're also happy uh, to support the creation of advisory bodies uh, on particularly difficult areas of policy. And we know that that happens all the time, right? Like uh, the US government has an advisory bo a body uh, about uh, African Americans, uh, similar bodies exist for, for sort of climate policy, similar bodies, uh, advisory bodies existed during COVID to advise governments about how to make health policy. We're perfectly happy to support all of those things. First argument then, in principle, we would say this is an illegitimate form of policy making. Essentially, this is a state power principle, which is just to say that this body is not accountable to the people. And so even if you believe all of the benefits that this affirmative team explains to you, even if you believe that this will make like a excellent policy, it is an illegitimate way to make that policy and we would oppose it on those grounds. Uh, and the note that I'd make here uh, is that they might say that uh, this only serves an auxiliary function to government, and so it's not, you know, really a violation of people's rights. Uh, but I, I note, and for the reason I explained and set up, they obviously have to support some degree of, pow of power being given to this body. We would suggest that that is an illegitimate form of power. The reason for that is uh, the government exerts power, a huge amount of power over you. The policies that a government makes massively impacts your life, uh, and this is suggested by this affirmative team right? Like climate policy or policing policy massively Im uh, impacts people's lived experience. The police, which is a, a sort of like an arm of the government, uh, has the power to police you. They have the power to lock you up. They have the power to put you in jail. Uh, the government has the power to do things like tax you in order to create this kind of policy. All of those, uh, the state has an enormous amount of resources uh, to exert an enormous amount of power over you. And we would say that that is, that degree of control is only legitimate to the extent that people are able to hold that to hold the government accountable it is only legitimate when you can exercise that level of accountability uh these and this is absolutely not applicable for these kinds of bodies right like this is 150 random guys that have been selected they are unelected you did not ele elect them they will not be held accountable you cannot hold them accountable by, by voting or none of those mechanisms apply to this body and we would suggest that for that reason any decision that they make that massively impacts your life uh massively impacts your life is illegitimate. Uh, and I guess the analogy here is that even if I could perfectly uh, control Matt's life, even if I had all of the knowledge to, you know, like a design a path forward for Matt that would make his life perfect, it would be illegitimate for me uh, to force him to do it because it's his life. Uh, it, like he is an autonomous individual. He ought to make decisions about himself. And if he cannot hold me accountable for the things that I am forcing him to do, we would say that that is immoral. That is the, anal that is the analogy for this kind of body. Their sort of, uh, I guess, response here or the way that they kind of try to get around this is to say uh, that this body is likely to be representative. Uh, I'll deal with that now. We would say that even if this body is representative of you, it's not clear that they, it is still not clear why it is legitimate for them to have the power to exercise complete control over you. Uh, and I'll sort of uh, explain this in two ways. First of all, it is not clear why that representation, even if that representation exists, it is not clear why that representation is enough uh, to get over the enormous barrier, which is that you have to be able to, uh, to consent to this kind of, to consent to that kind of control. And you have to, and you have to be able to, to hold it accountable. Uh, citizens, citizens still cannot consent to this body, even if it is perfectly representative of them. They still cannot hold it accountable because it's just like 150 random people that get convened and, and then the body dissolves. They still cannot hold it accountable. Representation is not enough. But second of all, we will flip uh, representation by explaining why this body is likely to be less representative of the people uh, than a government is. A few reasons. First of all, for every way that they say that governments can be unrepresentative, uh, the government is the one, uh, governments are the people who are appointing these bodies. They're the ones convening it. Uh, 
it is just as likely to be unrepresentative, but it is one level removed. So you directly elect the government in those countries, but then the government just chooses these people. It is one, it is more removed, it's likely to be more unrepresentative. And we know the government can, can twist this in ways that are quite perverse. Governments can do things like gerrymandering to, to make the sort of representational uh, spread convenient for them. Uh, they can control the, um, the spread of information and the, the particular information that experts are giving these people. They're likely to use those in quite perverse ways. And they can see to this when they say, oh, well, these people have the power to, uh, to sorry, the government will have the power to background check these people and decide if they have a conflict of interest. Giving them that power is terrible, particularly where governments have a vested interest in creating particular kinds of policy. They are likely to, to like sort of make, create the makeup of this body in a way that is bad. But second of all, even where it is done perfectly, there's always a degree of randomness to the sample. There are so many different axes along which representation operates. It's, it is it, it is impossible without the sort of getting the full like the full selection of everyone's opinions via things like voting or via things like referenda it is impossible to guarantee that these things will be perfectly representative you cannot guarantee that even if you even if, if you found a white woman who was five foot one exactly like me it is impossible to decide that she would have exactly the same policy opinions as me that representation always has a degree of randomness thirdly though it is possible for people to opt out of this process and we think that they, that they likely will particularly uh, the most vulnerable people the most vulnerable people the poorest people are likely to want to opt out of this process they do not have they do not have a month to give over where they need to be making income uh, to go and decide climate policy. They're likely to opt out. It's likely to be imperfect for that reason. At the end of that, even if you believe all of their arguments about why this policy is likely to be good, we explain why it is illegitimate and we would not support it on that basis. Secondly, though, these uh, bodies are likely to make terrible decisions for the reason that the people making them up will make will literally just make terrible decisions. The policy will be bad. Five reasons. First of all, uh, politicians typically have huge amount of amounts of education, huge amounts of experience in making this kind of policy these kinds of policy and I guess the structural reason for that is just that they need it to be elected right like people do not want to elect people who don't have experience who don't have high levels of education politicians are more comparatively more likely to be far more knowledgeable and they're likely to make better decisions on that basis but second of all these policies and crucially these policies are likely to be highly technical policies drafting cl climate policy or, or changing policing is hard uh not being able to understand them fully, not having the experience of having crafted this kind of policy before is likely to be an enormous impediment to these bodies' abilities to make good policy. But thirdly, weird demographic accidents can happen too that would massively pervert, that would massively pervert this kind of policy, particularly given the sample size is so small, right? Like 150 people is not a lot. Uh, so maybe like you convene a climate a climate body together and maybe you just randomly get a random demographic where a huge amount of them are climate deniers and you get terrible policy for that reason. Uh, but also, uh, you are and for the reasons I suggested earlier, you are likely to get the most privileged set of people. Weird demographic, demographic accidents like that just will make this policy terrible. Maybe not all the time, but in a significant portion of the cases. Fourthly, these people are uninformed. They do not have, and importantly, they do not have enough time to meaningfully under, understand this policy. Like you have a month to understand how to write climate policy. That is obviously not enough. They are likely to be terrible. Uh, politicians know how to do this though. But fifthly, they're far, far easier to lobby. This team explains that there is enormous media pressure uh, and, and enormous corporate capture of the media on these kinds of, of issues. People are far, far more likely to be vulnerable to that. Uh, they are less accountable and they're not used to being lobbied. They're far more likely to fall victim to it. But the third thing I would suggest is just that buy into this policy will be bad. People will feel like this policy has been made in ways that are illegitimate. Governments will feel as though it's been made by people that are silly and they will not implement it properly. And these policies do rely on buy-in. They do rely on buy-in from firms and for individuals to make this kind of thing worse. Brendan will expand on this in a second. For all these reasons, this policy will be terrible, but even if it was great, it would be principally illegitimate and we oppose it. We thank the speaker for their fine speech, P2, whenever you're ready. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Luigi, Frederick Brown TM Day. Um, okay, I'm going to start my speech. So I did my speech in three, two, one, and go. My argument today is going to be very simple. I'm going to talk about why this creates entire support structures and in local institutions to generate more political involvement. And I'm going to talk about why this makes activism more grassroots. That's, that's one argument. Before this, I have a few points of response. So I'm going to spend two responses to discuss the proposed alternatives that were provided by the previous speaker, which is on the regular process of legislation and on the referenda and specific policy voting. And then I'm going to respond to the arguments on illegitimate form of power and the buy-in argument presented by the previous speaker. So let's go over the comparatives presented by them. Firstly, 
on the regular processes of legislation and trusting these political officials to be able to survey the political preferences of people. So I have two things to say here. Firstly, our argument was to say the limitation of relying on politicians is that they are subject to significant political lobbying, they are solely concerned with staying in political power, and thus they are mostly perceived to not always being representative of the will of the people. This is the problem of the status quo already. We even said many of them are already in privilege and are already disconnected from the lives, the lived experiences of people. Their response is to say, compared to a citizen assembly, we can hold politicians accountable because we elect them into power and they are accountable to the public. So using our analysis, our existing analysis against them, we said that this is significantly mitigated by the fact that they're not directly accountable to the people, um, not just because of the time lag that happens because of election cycles, but also because of the financing that backs them up by these different large political institutions like political parties or by lobby groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But more than this, I think that um, the citizen assembly is more satisfactory for the vast majority of individuals because it's not about you thinking you can hold the government accountable, but a citizen assembly is one way as an instrument to hold politicians more to account for political or specific policy crafting designs that the citizen assembly is able to produce. So in that respect, we think this is one way that uh, adds information to the legislative process that would have otherwise not existed because they would have just voted based on the political preferences of the political party in ways that they could reverse the decision of the previous political administration, which would be detrimental to the rest of the public. The second response I want to say here is that let's use their argument against them. This is there, this could be largely unrepresentative or even more so unrepresentative of the people because the citizen assembly is a closer approximation of the will of the people. We provided analysis at first speaker as to why the current political climate is often skewed. And that often skews the representations or the political beliefs of some individuals on the ground itself because of media polarization or social media being an unconducive platform political speech because you're only ch channeling out for likes or viral views or sometimes you only um, po 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 posit out the most excessive extreme policies when in reality the lived experiences of the vast majority of random people may not always be as extreme all the time and their beliefs may not always be that way. So putting this neutral platform makes it potentially more representative of a vast majority of the of moderate people's beliefs or a group of people's beliefs that would likely compromise with what this policy would look like. And we think that we mitigate these polarizations in the process of citizen assembly. On their second policy, on the referenda and specific policy voting. So this runs into a lot of problems because they spent no time defending this at all in their speech. Firstly, referenda and specific policy voting is subject to significant biases as well. Using their own argument against them, the poor may not always vote in these as well because it takes a long time to go out and vote. They, using their own argument against us as well, a referendum might take a month long and it also might be limited in surveying the preferences of people. So what's the difference? The difference with the referenda and specific policy voting is the lack of the mechanisms of a citizen assembly that are very specific and very concrete in being able to get specialist advice that might mitigate the worst um, polar, polarized beliefs or opinions of different individuals. It gives a jury-type neutral setting that allows people to discuss their stories and allow people to listen more conducively to one another. And it is at least not subject to the large macro forces of the media and the pressures that are involved. We think this makes it more trustworthy it makes it easier for people not to be enraged and outraged by the results of a citizen assembly and the expectation of its rigor, rigor makes it more likely for it to um, uh, be uh, more representative or, or be more trusted by more individuals. Lastly, on their argument on the illegitimate form of power, on it being illegitimate and unrepresentative. Um, the, our, the, the claim that the state having power over your life, the monopoly of state argument, it's not a justification that this citizen assembly has illegitimate power. This is not mutually exclusive as a characterization because they also rely on legislation and they also rely on other forms that defer themselves to government. But specifically on participation, this is the second response, we believe that the solution to their problem to flip it is sometimes misrepresentative citizen assemblies 
is to have a regular process of many citizen assemblies on our side, which is why citizen assemblies can correct previous citizen assemblies. The expectation that future citizen assemblies can be conducted are also ways in which that can improve the lower political climate too, because we mitigate the randomness of statistics, uh, the gerrymandering or the ways that some minorities may not be included. So this, these are all mitigated with having more of these surveys conducted because it's cost efficient, and it's also one that concentrates the best quality information in one period for certain people, which makes it easier for people to opt in, and it makes it more productive in that respect. Going to the argument, since this is a random selection process, states have the incentive to prime individuals and prepare them in the event that they may be selected for this duty. So this is similar to preparation for being enlisted for military service in some countries or the expectation that you would have to serve jury duty or eventually familiarize yourself with the internal process in court. They could do this through statewide campaigns to educate the public on how citizen assembly is conducted. And on the other hand, individuals and local institutions will also have incentives to prepare themselves for this process since you know they, they also want to make sure that they can make most, of the op most out of this opportunity since most people likely care about these issues that are controversial. This could take the form of town halls, more community meetings in the run-up to a citizen assembly, and schools and universities participating in this discourse too. What then is the limitation of the status quo? We believe that the problem with the state of political involvement across most states today is that grassroots engagement is on the decline or is minimal. This can be limited or threatened by multiple factors, such as that A, there is a collective action problem that no one social civic organization is willing to be the first one to invest in a town hall because the backlash would be immense among social movements and small groups. B, membership is in the decline because at the local level, they feel disconnected from national politics issues due to a lacking opportunity to see their impact. And C, they may sometimes be afraid to speak out on their opinions in public on their own because they are afraid of criticism from the state or maybe even criticism from their own peers. We solve this in the following ways through a citizen assembly. When there is the expectation that everyone should prepare for a citizen assembly, then it becomes relatively more acceptable to hold these town halls regularly and to organize your own events to discuss these issues in the open without criticism from the state because this is state supported. But secondly, organizations can provide specific supervision and training for potential membership, and they're able to specialize in the preparation or guidance for many of these citizen assemblies by also offering their expert advice to these citizen assemblies too. So we activate many of these movements, we give them a platform in which they are able to concentrate their resources in a citizen assembly rather than the disparate resources that are divided in the status quo. For these reasons, we are very, very proud to propose. We thank your speaker for their fine speech, O2, whenever you're ready. starting in three, two, one. First thing I'm gonna do in this speech is to litigate the metrics that underpin this debate. Because on side negative, we say the most important consideration in any liberal democracy is accountability. And by definition, this body is unaccountable. Whereas the affirmative team merely says, well, we should ought to maximize representation. Obviously, both values matter, but there are three reasons as to why our benefit of accountability ought be considered more. The first is that accountability is a non-consequentialist, principally necessary condition that the consent of the government is the only way to legitimize the tyranny of the state. And by con contrast, this affirmative team actually never provides a non-consequentialist justification for the importance of representation, because by first affirmative, representation is merely an end means to an end for preference aggregation, so their principled heart argument is hung on the contingency of this being an effective method of preference aggregation. The upshot of this is that we have a principally a non-contested, non-contingent claim on accountability. So in order to outweigh this, they need to prove an overweening benefit of representation. But I would note also that they also undercut their principle of representation by their own speech. 
The fact that they are modeling in that we would vet conflicts of interest suggests that representation is not that important. The fact that they concede that you need arbiters or legislators to act as a proxy indicates that representation is not super important to the degree that they want it to be. But secondly, even irrespective of that principal dimension, there are two practical way and considerations to believe why our argument on accountability is more important. The first is that there is a corollary benefit of accountability, and that is buy-in, which received insufficient response. Because even if our world is not perfectly accountable, the perception that people feel that they are accountable of their government is what enables them to have buy-in and to go and pass through and to obey the policies and laws the government passes. Second affirmative response is, well, no, in fact, it is representation that makes people feel like they want to buy into the government. But we would say that most people do not believe and trust in the government to be fully representative. What people trust is their ability to vote in the voting booths for themselves. And that degree of control is asymmetric and therefore people have greater buy-in in our world. The reason why that is an independent benefit that wins this debate outright is that the state actually has very marginal capacity to enforce the ability of people to follow the law and much of these policies. So to the extent that this policy erodes buy-in, it also erodes the enforcement of the these policies and the practical ability of these policies to impact people's lives. The second reason for why um, accountability is important is that it introduces the important consideration of reversibility, which is to say that in their world, there is no ability to correct for a policy when the people pass something that is unpopular in instances when that works, because there's no method of voting them out. Obviously, the comparative in our world is that if people, governments do things that are wrong, they tend to be voted out and punished in the electoral cycle. Again, that was unique to our world, and that was why accountability was de facto the most important consideration in the debate, and the inability to respond to it means we automatically win. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to assume that even if you believe that representation is the most consider important consideration in the debate, why their one is less representative than the counterfactual. Before that, I just want to discount all of the substandard that we hear from the second affirmative. Their first and primary claim is that, well, uh, states now have an uh, incentive to educate you prior to this in, in the case that you might need to participate. Firstly, it's a one in like a million chance that you would be ever called up to this in the first place. I think that erodes the extent to which there is any goodwill to fund these education programs in the first place, but it also erodes any incentive on you as an individual to partake in this because it's something that is akin to you know winning the lottery. It's extraordinarily infeasible that you would ever be called up to this. But secondly, we would say that in fact, the government educating people in order to pass this into this program, it will be done enormously perversely in such a way as to entirely erode the independence benefit of this claim. Because obviously governments would use these education programs to in order to ensure that people do not use these powers in bad ways that conflict with their own agenda. So clearly this was an extraordinary concession that I think knives their benefit. Okay. With that out of mind, why is it that representation is still worse in their world compared to our counterfactual? The first thing I want to note, and this is the context that second affirmative entirely misses, is that the premise of the debate is a context where there's already been a national reckoning on very controversial policies in order for this citizens assembly to even exist in the first place. And that has two important implications. The first is that first affirmative generic list of why democracies can fail do not apply because this world happens upstream of that. But secondly, we would say that the uh, more represent uh, there are more representative alternatives that may exist in the counterfactual, like a national referendum, which would just be this, but time to the max. And obviously, you know, the uh, second affirmative mitigation to this is like, well, some of the problems still symmetricize. Obviously not, because a referenda is a one-day compulsory vote, whereas working on the citizens' assembly would be, an, you know, a commitment of up to three years. So clearly, the barrier to entry is far better on our world. But critically, what I want to explain is why is our counterfactual mutually exclusive and will be, in fact, chilled out by the imposition of the citizens' assembly? And the key thing to note is that this is a policy that strikes a very convenient middle ground. It allows governments to claim the optical benefit of, you know, listening to the will of the people, but at the same time governments do still have some degree of control over this legislative body in a way that they can able to influence it uh relative to a national referendum where governments have less control to do so but secondly we would note that this policy will be used as a political scapegoat which means that um decisions when decisions are conducted unfavorably governments will point to that and they're unlikely to do policies on themselves to avoid that which means that second affirmative framing of this is an additional layer of accountability does not apply because we explain that this form of accountability will come at the cost of other degrees of accountability so that is why it does not apply and and notably i think the buying argument that i've already explained occurs upstream of all of this because buying pred is is a necessary precondition for these benefits to occur so 
even if you don't believe that context push, the second problem with this ne negative affirmative team is that they never explain why the policy decisions that these citizens will make will in fact even be reflective of their own interests, let alone that of the populace. And the key thing that we would note is that there is a unique pressure on these citizens to do things, the internal need to perform well, that is exacerbated by enormous media scrutiny. And to the extent that First Affirmative wants to make this as transparent as possible, that means that there is public information of who these people are, where they live, what their political interests are, which gives media companies and, 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 and lobbying agents all the time and the capacity in the world in order to pressure these people in ways that I want. Crucially, what is the comparative in this argument? Because second affirmative says, well, the problem is politicians are not perfectly accountable and representative of the people. Obviously, it's a mitigation. Perhaps in some ways they're steered by interest. But notably, many politicians also just pass policies that are reflective of their own interests. And that is why democracy works, is that people act, 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 acting in mutual self-interest are able to do things like that. But the problem is politicians have a greater capacity to insulate themselves from the external pressures because there are a person that has been working in public life for years who is a system of you know public relations officers who has a party infrastructure behind them to back them in cases where things go wrong that is something that an ordinary citizen plucked from the crowd is not likely to have which means that the ordinary citizen is far more likely to be a victim of pressure and that pressure is likely to mean that they are more likely to be captured than the counterfactual so that does not apply the last thing i want to explain is um, even if you do not believe that the unique pressure makes voters bad, the second thing to say is to consider what is the type of person we are talking about. Because the vast majority of second affirmative speech is to mitigate the extent to which uh, politicians are representative. But the problem is the type of person that is uh, you know, going to embark upon a political career is also the, probably the type of person that would self-select into this, which is to say that disprivileged people, unfortunately, do not have the extensive time to give up most of their you know, working life in order to serve in this policy. So at best, the type of people are likely to be from very narrow privileged constraints the difference then is whose interests do these people serve because in our world privileged people still have to get the votes of disprivileged whereas in their world there is no incentive for you to embark upon anyone who is outside your bubble and in fact the friends and family that will likely advise you on this are from that privileged constraint so for those reasons our world is more comparative uh representative we thank the speaker for the fine speech p3 whenever you're ready i do want things should be good fast. to go now. Great. Uh, yes, of course, I want the capacity to say hello to my friends and family who are with me at home because you're not in an in-person tournament. <laughs> uh, Sorry, my speech in three, two, one. There are two problems with NEG. The first is they have zero conception of new ones. They assert that for you to be ultimately representative, you have to do direct democracy and not trust representative democracy, which I think first affirmative has clearly outweighed already. So a lot of their questions on the principle either are washed out or do not apply in their alternative of referenda at the point where they don't explain why referenda is able to hold individuals accountable or why politicians themselves will be held accountable if the system is so broken that governments themselves will appoint individuals that they already are aligned with in the group. But secondly, there's a large tension. At second, like they say, well, it is the case that these individuals will be scrutinized so much by the public. But they also say that these individuals are not held accountable. I think if it is the case that their public information are present, that individuals in the media are likely to scrutinize them on their votes, as well as individuals who indeed are invested and how the policies are constructed will likely ask them about it. That means that these individuals are likely to be questioned by the decisions, likely have incentives to do well, as opposed to, as they concede at negative politicians who have experience, politicians who are insulated from public pressure. Because if they are incumbents indeed, then these incumbents do not care so much about making sure that they indeed are held accountable. Even accountability mechanisms are going to be insufficient against it. Two things in this speech. Firstly, accountability and explaining why negative does not fulfill their metric, or even then, why accountability is less crucial than representation, and secondly, on why these policies will likely be better under our side. What I want to flag about accountability is, what's next only mechanism for accountability is that you can vote people out. Note, even if we concede that under our side, these are citizens that you may not be able to hold accountable, I will flag three weighing mechanisms for why it is fine. Firstly, because as we explained, representation in terms of controversial issues matters the most. What Sakura Negative tells us is, well, it doesn't matter so much because there are other things that you concede to, like other individuals that are not able to vote in it. The problem is, I agree with first negative. These indeed are controversial issues. In their alternative, in most cases, these often are in the hands of politicians 
politicians who are lobbied, etc. Which means that under their side, you do not get that form of accountability as well because individuals will utilize it through lobbying. But also in the comparative, they're also not fully accountable. So in a world where these politicians potentially are corrupt based on their assumption, I think that representation is the way you're able to mitigate harms of accountability because that preemptively ensures that individuals already have a level of accountability and being able to particularly participate in. But secondly, I just do not think the harm of lack of accountability is massive. In democracies, in many cases, we potentially uh, forego accountability for so long as we ensure that this is indeed the constructed social contract that people participate in and consent in. People can opt out of it. People can question the policies in the current way. I think you can also convene a citizens' assembly later on if these potentially are harmful things. All of the accountability metrics that we explained at first affirmative potentially still exist. We think that these accountability mechanisms do not overpower representation. But lastly, even if representation does not matter as much, I just do not think the mechanism of voting people out really operates. So at a point where we explain that their alternative of being able to vote people out does not work, they're weighing the their weighing is broken, even if accountability matters more. There are three ways I'm going to do that. The first account, uh, the first metric they provide, or the first um, mechanism they provide for why you get accountability under their side is because they're unelected. I'll make two observations. The first is that all the alternatives they provide, like advisory boards who potentially provide advice to a lot of politicians, are also equally as accountable, unaccountable, and also themselves are appointed by politicians, which is why you have a lot of, um, like, you have Bumbo Marcus, for example, in the Philippines, appointing individuals who themselves are friends with, and even referenda and polls are equally as unaccountable. Potentially, potentially far less because they are far, far larger in scale as second negative as the response to the negative will probably give here is, well, at the very least, they are not the ones who have, are in control of legislation. I, I agree, under our side, you still have a general direction that happens, right? You are still only designing the legislation, but at the very least, under our side, you provide power to the individuals who are far more equal and transparent as they provide in the characterization in this intro. But secondly, as well, even if these alternatives are potentially equally as transparent. Second negative concedes that people vote for elections and trust for themselves. At the point where they concede they are happy with representative democracy, I'm unclear as to why our forms of accountability like do not work because you're just still extending a lot of these mechanisms to the individuals who are appointed by the government, assuming that is the case that negative says. But the second thing I want to point out is it assumes politicians themselves are already held accountable. I will neutralize this and I'll explain why individuals are far more accountable. Firstly, because if politicians oftentimes are insulated from the public, as they point out, right? They often have security guards. They often come from IV institutions. They often are not expect, uh, experiencing the realities with other individuals and therefore do not actively consult them. When they make a bad policy, policy decisions, they get they are not actively hurt by the family members. They are not actively questioned by the family members. On our comparative, you are accountable to your own city, to the individuals who are your neighbors, to the people who also will ask you, hey, why are the prices going up or not? Potentially, these are potentially negative pressure on the worst case scenario, but these are how you're able to hold these individuals accountable because you may not vote them out, but their individual lived experiences and their day-to-day -day lives are far harder in the case where they do bad policies. And that's why the scale of it, even if it is a vote versus like basically their entire day-to-day -day lives being affected is far greater under our side in terms of our me mechanism. But these are one reason for politicians are potentially not as accountable is even if they are having consultations, they oftentimes are insulated. Like they often have laws in terms of being outvoted. They often have to serve full terms. Often it's very, very hard for you to do a vote of no confidence, especially if you're a prime minister, especially because there often is a lot of incumbency bias. That means to say that they often capture media far more. They are the ones who capture media on, on negative side that claim that, oh, it's very controversial. So I think it's very, very likely that they're going to be able to utilize a lot of these journalists or whatever um, uh, uh, on their side, as opposed to citizens who oftentimes have less power to do it. But thirdly, I just, uh, what Second Next says is that reputation doesn't matter, uh, representation doesn't matter because you support representative democracy. I just want to point out that even if representation doesn't matter, we think we're able to at least fulfill the accountability. There are two other mechanisms that Negative says. The first is that the, uh, the education it likely creates will be very, very bad because they oftentimes, governments will be the ones appointed and they therefore it will oftentimes conflict with agenda. What I'll flag here is all the reasons for why governments will do policies well are equally incentives to appoint well. So if we believe that politicians are are pressured by it, then I think they're probably going to be pressured to appoint well. This is why first affirmative conception of the world with being able to show different ideologies also work in terms of being able to point out if you are doing a public policy for economics, you're probably going to view the uh, liberal way to do it, the neoclassical way to do it, the like Marxist way to do it, meeting this perfectly fine. Um, but also secondarily, I don't think uh, that this is an exaggeration. It's literally not just 150 over 100 million people. There are likely many citizen assemblies across many issues. So I do think there is public pressure to be able to constantly do it and constantly correct it. But even if you are not 
not in a citizen assembly and notice the state mechanism they provide at negative about how people will likely opt out, you'll be very invested in how it turns out and that, how it's turned out and that alone increases political turnout as per the second negative extension. At this point, therefore, we're able to explain even if it's not the best policy, we're able to increase grassroots involvement and that is the extension we do not get a response from coming from second negative. Um, and that's why even if information is perverse, we think we're able to explain that there's better interpretation and better interaction with democracy. We think generally is good because it increases the way that people are able to oppose governments if governments are so bad. Secondly, and less, will these policies be good? Because I think generally the only response they provide at first negative is it'll be good because politicians have experience. Note that these experiences often are not experiences in terms of like going on public transport, getting an abortion, but rather are things that are potentially about being in politics. I will flip this in two ways. The first is if they, they, they do, do have experience experience, that's how they're able to collect a lot of corporate connections and are exposed to networks who can assure that they, them wins, which means that it's often better to not be steeped in legislation and being in politicking because that experience is often bad. But second flip is, even if these are politicians who often are incumbents, public pressure on them to do good work happens less, which means that in a comparative, even if politicians have a good experience, individuals on the board experience being a citizen of that country themselves and therefore equally should be better represented. They are day-to-day -day experiencing it and that is why these policies are oftentimes better. For these reasons, affirmative wins. We thank the speaker for their fine speech. O3, whenever you're. Can I be heard? Very clearly. Thanks. All right. Look at that. I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. The reason the affirmative team loses this debate very clearly is because there is a shocking lack of a response to an enormous amount of analysis that we give you about why these people will just not be able to write good policy because they at best prove that these people will have good intentions. Great. But in the vast majority of cases, there's not a difference of intention. Everyone agrees that we should have good climate change policy. Everyone agrees we should have efficient criminal justice. But these are highly technical policy areas where they simply will not be able to. So let's start with that question. Then I will talk about the principle. What are their claims on good policy? Their claim is simply these people better represent the community. My first observation is that I will explain later why it is that these are, in fact, not more representative. So I will flip this mechanism. But secondly, even if you believe that this is more representative, it doesn't matter if you're more representative of the community because first in most cases the distinctions over how we should do policy aren't about the intentions that we have as i explained in my introduction on most policy areas we broadly agree we want efficient taxation policy you know we want economic growth those are things that people all believe in we want higher wages but we have a difference over how to get there so we need people who are intelligent enough to do so but second even if you have good intentions good intentions only matter insofar as you are able to action those intentions through policy so that means that you they don't get to action their more representation anyway. So even, their claim here is, oh, you have sets of experience, but you don't have sets of experience, uh, you know, in the actual world. First, we like this isn't necessarily the important sets of experience. You need sets of experience in policy writing, in economics, in law. And secondly, yes, often they do because political parties and voters have incentives to represent, uh, to elect people who are from those communities. They have incentives to have people who represent them. And third, even if they are not demographically representative of them, they are accountable to sets of voters who have to do have those lived experiences who first of all they have incentives to talk to to canvas for their views and secondly who will vote them out if they do not do the things that they support so with their claims on this quality of policy out let us this is just going to be whipping from cat speech explaining why it is they're unlikely to be able to do good sets of policies the first thing we explain is that 
that these are highly, highly technical policy areas, right? Things like environmental reform, things like law reform, where are there, there are so many different moving parts that you have to understand. And we explain that politicians are, on average, smarter than the median individual. They are more qualified. That is first for the reason that they have the experience writing legislation. They understand how to write legislation. Second, for the reason that they are typically just more intelligent. And third, for the reason that they are typically more qualified. And the structural reason for that is that voters vote for people who are smarter and more qualified. But you can see that empirically. The ratio of economics PhDs in the Australian parliament is like seven in 150 people. It's massively disproportionate, right? We vote for people who are smarter. This is debate winning for, <laughs> like, like, if you are not intelligent enough to write good policy, if you do not have the experience, I don't give a shit how good your intentions are. But the second thing we explain is that you will not be sufficiently informed to even be able to do it, right? Like when, we, when Australia did a, a, a carbon tax, Wayne Swan spent two years going through the bowels of various companies, working with the public service to design it. You cannot take people away from their lives for, you know, two or three years to be able to do this in a one month little, like, like whatever meeting that you have, we all go live at this place. There's not enough time to be able to understand. So, and they might say, oh, we can do the research beforehand. But first of all, they would not have sufficient time to be able to understand all of the information that they were given by the public server. But secondly, you cannot simply provide them with previous information because they need sets of information on the new sets of policies that they are going to be implementing, right? You need to be able to propose a policy, do like a two-year scoping study to understand and how that is likely to happen. So they're not likely to have the information to make good policy either. Third, we explain that you get random demographic accidents, right? For the reason that you might just randomly get like a massively disproportionate amount of conspiracy theorists or people who don't believe in climate change in this because that's what happens when you have such a small sample size. And fourth, we explain they're much easier to lobby because they do not know how to deal with it. This has been just mostly whipping, but all of that material about how they cannot write good policy loses this affirmative team, this debate very, very clearly. But we provide more reasons why it is that actually the policy will be better. And that is for the reason that people will buy in and follow this policy. Because when they did not have control, when they do not feel it is legitimate, they're not likely to actually want to buy in and follow that policy because media narratives can take advantage of the fact that this was done illegitimately. And I point, for instance, when it was that unelected health bureaucrats did lockdowns during COVID in Australia, people and the media used that as a justification to not follow them because they said this is an illegitimate piece of policy, right? So that means that people aren't going to do it because the state only has limited enforcement capacity to get people to follow its laws. It largely relies on the sets of buy-in, which shoots this affirmative team's benefit in the foot. Because if people don't actually follow the laws and the new sets of policies, what is the benefit that they get? The second thing we tell you to almost no response is that politicians who are writing the legislation and implementing the sets of recommendations from these citizens' assemblies will not listen and will not implement them well because they do not personally believe in it. So in the technocratic ways that they actually write up the legislation, they are far less likely to actually implement it well. So we explain very, very clearly that these would be bad decisions to just a tremendous lack of response to all of the mechanisms that we provide in cat speech and overwhelmingly clear negative team victory on that issue. Now let's turn to the issue of the principle. We explain that the government enforces its will upon you and the only way for that to be legitimate is for you to have control over that government. How do they respond? They respond, uh, the first thing I want to call out is that there's a bit of tr a trick at third affirmative, which is to say, ah, but this is symmetric to your advisory bodies. No, this is a misunderstanding of what we say, which is that the advisory bodies do not have the same sets of power that the citizens assemblies do. They are a mechanism for transmitting information to politicians, but citizens assemblies, as you set up, from first are likely to be listened to and are likely to have significant power because they're seen as representing the people. So it is not anti-democratic to provide them with information, it is anti-democratic to override their will. They then say, ah, but referenda are also unaccountable. First, this is a small fraction of our counterfactual. It's usually just legislators doing it who are, are accountable. But secondly, accountability mechanisms are only necessary insofar as you abrogate control to another body. The reason you don't need accountability mechanisms on a referendum is because everyone is doing it, right? But when you aggregate control to a smaller group of people, then the larger body needs to be able to hold them accountable. Their second claim is they can hold them accountable to like street harassment or whatever. Like, like that is not a way that we're like, Brendan's mechanism here is they might be lobbied by the people in, in their area. That is a harm, but there's a way for everyone to hold them accountable. And they probably live in similar areas with similar demographics to them who would have the same sets of policy priorities to them. That's not a way for everyone to hold them accountable. Their final claim is our ah, lobby takes away your, your ability to be accountable. Think about the complete lack of analysis and the, just, the enormous amount that they rely on lobbying completely out 
abrogating the ability of all citizens ever to be able to vote out their government. That is an absurd scale of lobbying that they claim. Their claim in response to our principle of accountability is, ah, but you are representative. This is not a response. We get over it in two ways. The first thing we way we get over this is that we explain that if you believe they get representation and we get accountability, we explain why accountability is more important than representation. First, for the reason that it's not clear that representation is an absolute moral good in the same way that accountability and consent clearly is. And secondly, because there's lots of different types of representation across lots of different axes, and it is only we can only know that this is the type of representation that people want through consent. But additionally, we get up because it is clear that our side is the only one who can get accountability. But it's not actually clear that their side is more representative than legislatures. And we explain why representation is actually better, why legislators are more representative than these bodies. First, because people can opt out. Second, because there's random def demographic changes. But third, and most importantly, because for every problem that they identify with democracy, the legislators who are appointing these groups of people have those problems as well. They're just one step removed and less accountable. And they give the legislators an enormous amount of power when they say the legislators are going to be able to check whether or not you have a conflict of interest and individually decide who should be on it. That means they have the power to decide who is on it. So they will have their biases in the way that they select as well. So it will be just as unrepresentative. We thank the speaker for their fine speech. I'll reply whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Well, there are two questions in the debate. Firstly, what is the importance of accountability? Secondly, who gets better policies? Starting on the issue of accountability, because we provide a principal justification of accountability that is virtually untouched by this affirmative team. Their only response to this is to suggest that accountability is imperfect in other ways or may be imperfect in our counterfactual. This misses two responses. The first is that we explain that the unique harm that the affirmative team introduces is a body that is wholly accountable. So even if the world in the status in the status quo was unaccountable, what they were doing was adding an additional layer of unaccountability that was principally unjustified. But secondly, we made those arguments in the counterfactual as an even if to this argument. So the confluence of the characterizations in this debate did not apply. The simplest reason for why this issue won us to debate was because we were the only side that provided comprehensive weighing that was clear that meant that this issue us today. Firstly, the fact that it was independent of any consideration of whether policies were marginally better or worse in our world, because we explained that accountability was a non-consequentialist good, because it was the only way you could legitimize the consent of the government. But secondly, because we explained that accountability had a series of other benefits. So going into the second issue of what gets better policies, you have to believe that this affirmative team must uh, uh, prove an extraordinarily marginal, uh, in enormous increase in policy reform in order for them to win this issue. And the reason why I'm starting here is because it's the uh, only issue that this affirmative team really meaningfully contests insofar as all their arguments about why we improve representation are just roundabouts proxies of explaining why we get better policies. There were three evidentiary burdens that this team needed to fulfill. The first is that they needed to explain why people would have the freedom to make decisions that in fact reflected their own interests, whereas we explained that random citizens were very prone to being captured by political interests. And third affirmative's only response to this is just a tension of pointing out just that isn't accountability what we want, but that misunderstands the nature of skepticism that was valuable because scrutiny was necessary only when it is a representative acting in their own interest and whether that matches the interest that you have as a voter. Whereas what we explain is the pressure that this affirmative team causes is one that distorts the ability of the representative to make that decision in the first place. We explain explain that a citizen is far more vulnerable to that because they were not accustomed to a life of public life where they were scrutinized in that way and they do not have the capacity and support structures to lean against when they were faced with things like lobbying so that was the first reason why this actually meant the policies were worse but secondly we they needed to prove that people had the capacity to draft policies that reflect democratic interests and their only mechanism to explain this is to suggest to you that states will educate you prior to entering the system in the first place. But we gave you three harms. The first is that 
this just risks the um, being perverted in order to indoctrinate people into it such that it will never interfere with the demands of the government. But secondly, we explained that there was little incentive for people to engage with it, given that it was an unlikely process. And notably, the bar for information was extraordinarily high, given the extraordinarily technocratic nature of much of the reforms that this affirmative team wanted people to be drafting. Given the contested efficacy of this argument, what you had to weigh that against was all the competition selection processes that ensured that politicians tended to be better informed than the median, tended to have the better capacity to reflect and, and, and act on those interests than the median voter. And that inability, again, meant that people that drafting these policies were better in our world. But lastly, they need to explain why the policies drafted by this citizens' assembly or policies that people would respect and buy into. Because a simple mechanism that we explain both at first and second is that people were far more likely to buy into a system of government where people believed they had the control of accountability, uh, uh, control and accountability of the of the government rather than an absence of representation. And we make this, and the unique factor here is that irrespective of which world is more accountable, the most important way in deciding this characterization is people's feelings and perceptions of control. And it is far more pronounced in our world where you have a direct in controlling influence of a vote rather than trusting that the world in which the opponent team set their world up is one that is in fact representative of the demographics. Those three evidentiary burdens meant that this affirmative team could not achieve their own benefit of representation. And in fact, it was the very reason why they lost representation. Very proud to read this. We thank the speaker for their fine speech. Gov reply whenever you're ready. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm going to start my speech. Starting in three, two, one, and go. So the strongest contention from negative is that overriding power that citizen assemblies have will override other types of accountability in the status quo. Uh, so this is the issue on accountability. At first affirmative, we preempted this argument by explaining that the current ways politicians are held accountable are significantly unfair and skewed through the media, through lobbying groups, etc. So this alone discredits a large number of their accountability mechanisms because the people are also overlooked in this process as well. But even more than this, again, to respond to them, we explained that a strong citizen assembly is more important in the process or the democratic process to minimize the worst excesses of polarization in government and in public discussion, which they failed to respond to. In the worst case, what we said is that we think the influence that a citizen assembly has on the political process process is better than the type of influence that is exerted by the extreme public, which leads to government stopovers as well. Because again, it inevitably will still be voted by the Congress and the Senate. And the buy-in is most crucial here, especially when the polarization stops any legislation happening anyways on their comparative. That comparative lacked any analysis from negative, And that is why most of their analysis also falls and undermines itself. So again, even in the worst case, at the conclusion of this issue of accountability, the expert politicians necessarily have to be counterbalanced by a citizen assembly because of the ways in which politicians unfairly monopolize power in a po polarized setting. Our reasons for why an over-reliance on politicians alone is harmful are superior to their reasons as to why the public are lacking and underqualified because we said voters inevitably elect politicians too, which their comparative is reliant on. So the most charitable interpretation then is that politicians' idea of what is best, like what makes them smart, is sometimes different from what people's idea of what is best and thus the disjunct in lived experience is reconciled in a citizen assembly because many of these problems are resolved in a rigor and design in the neutrality process in the rigor of bringing in this advice that would have otherwise not existed or the information not provided to these citizens. This is why we believe our process is more accountable. How did we address the issue of credibility? After the affirmative, we explicitly responded that the pressure these citizens face is one, and this flips the argument, that contributes to the credibility of the process. At second affirmative, we explained this in terms of why it increases grassroots involvement and makes people invested in this process. And note that this also substantially resolves their problem on technicality and lack of reflection. Because if referenda right now are uninformed, or if people are uninformed or have difficulty processing the technicalities, 
this citizen assembly process resolves that because it is rigorous, because it is technical, and because they are educated in this process, but also because supporting institutions will support them in this process if there is an expectation of a citizen assembly that happens very often. Their weakest response was to say this will be perceived as unfair because a few number of individuals are selected and because they're severely underqualified. Again, a gross generalization. The citizen assembly can happen multiple times. It is a better version of a referenda because these are multiple concentrated platforms that collect preferences of people and design specific aspects of policy. Again, the specificity is unique. It attracts people's attention. It makes people more invested rather than just the headliner statements that the everyone drones out in the media all the time. So they're more involved rather than less involved. And then eventually handing it over to the government, which makes it easier to reconcile this. Even if it's only a few individuals, the representative random selection process makes it easier to maximize productivity by making it more efficient. So at the end of this issue, we prove that the mechanism of citizen assembly is self-correcting because it mitigates these biases, it manages the conflicts of interest, and that alone makes it easier for more individuals from the public to trust compared to the alternatives of solely relying on politicians or solely relying on referenda where many of these things are, are drowned out in, this, in discussions of polarization. So this neutral platform resolves it. Propose. We thank the speaker for their fine speech and to all speakers for a really enjoyable high quality debate. Here, yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for a very good debate. Before I get started, I just like to ask if people can that they turn their videos on just because um, it's really depressing giving an O into the void. Okay. So all three of us were able to come to a unanimous decision, like our ballots were all the same. We all gave it to team uh, negative, myself by a very, very close margin and Satvik by a relatively clear margin. So let me take you through the two main clashes in the debate. The first clash is how democratic is this? Is this principally justified? Um, and I thought that there were three main axes to this, but before that, a bit of framing. So the bulk of the P1 speech from Gov is actually just like, here's why the alternatives are really, really crap. Like legislators cannot be held accountable. They're subject to lobbying, referenda don't work, et cetera, et cetera. So the up framing for this is that, well, this doesn't actually matter even if we don't win on the alternatives being good, just because even if the status quo is bad, if we add another form of badness, then it's still bad. Um, I personally don't buy this framing just because if it's true that this form of citizens council replaces a kind of decision making in the status quo and that it's better, then you still get an increase in accountability or representation. A part of the debate just simply boils down to like, comparatively speaking, is this relatively more or less democratic Democratic than the than the alternatives um, that OP supports. So there are three axes that we use to evaluate this. The first is representation, the second is accountability, and the third is insulation from political corruption. So first on representation, I think props framing for their first argument is it's really, really important that we have citizens do this, especially when there are controversial decisions where there's no like clear benefit and it's all about trade-offs upon which then intuitively it matters for us to have a more representative group of people decide as opposed to politicians who often benefit just like systematically more privileged groups. Um, so I think that the op claim, op responses to this are quite interesting, um, but they are also not handled well. So there are two claims here. The first claim is that this is going to be a very long, very taxing and demanding process, which excludes the majority of people from the process and means that only people who are very privileged can opt into it, which means that the citizens councils will not have poor people, will only be quite um, elite. Um, I'm not sure how like in the spirit of the motion this is, just because I feel like it's intuitive for Gov to model that the citizens councils are reflective of the general population's demographics. However, I also never get a satisfactory response to this throughout P2, P3, or prop reply, and it is pushed consistently down our bench. So I do buy this analysis and I say like, okay, fine. So like these councils are not going to be representative. They are going to be quite privileged. Um, and then we also get a claim from opposition that in fact, politicians are going to be more representative because they are likely to be um, elect, they're going to be, because people want politicians who, who they feel can relate to them and who are down to earth as well. 
um, the response we get from P3 is just like a claim that politicians are more sheltered. Um, however, this is the same claim that has come from the very beginning of the prop uh, bench and is unresponsive to the claim from O2 that politicians oftentimes are down to earth and easy to relate to because that's what voters want. So for these reasons, um, on responsiveness, we buy that these citizens councils are going to be dominated by the privileged um, and that there are going to be some politicians at least who come from um, backgrounds that are relatively diverse. And for those reasons, we think off is winning on representation. Second of all, then on accountability and ability to vote in, um, vote people in or out. So I think that the prop claim on this is that legislation is really, really crap. Um, just because there are often delays, uh, politicians are within power, not just like for a variety of different reasons. And it's really hard for people to be like, you voted on X issue um, badly in a way that we disagree with, we're gonna remove you from, from office. Um, the op claim is just that there is no accountability at all because once people are appointed to this council, they cannot be removed. Um, and since there is no election cycle and there's no reason people want to be within um, these kind of councils, that they, there is not going to be a lot of accountability. The response we get from PROP is that there is a lot of accountability because people are going to be under pressure from those around them um, and therefore will behave in ways that are representative of their communities. Um, and I think that the response we get from OP is that, haha, this is street harassment and that's quite bad. And I'm like, yes, this is probably true. Um, however, it's not responsive to the claim that this works as accountability mechanism. So where I'm at right now is there are highly indirect methods of accountability for legislation for politicians from Gov. And from OP, I have, there are systems of, sorry, sorry from OP and for Gov, I have the idea that members of citizens' councils are held accountable because they're subject to pressure from people around them. How do we adjudicate between these two observations, both of which probably stand? I ultimately vote up on this for the reason that even though it's true that people are, representatives are held accountable on Gov's side, they are accountable to only a small fragment of the population if the representation claim from op stands, if that makes sense. So even if it's true that politicians are going to be held accountable on a very delayed or indirect basis, that is at least some form of accountability that might be true for the entire population, um, as opposed to just a small um, section of the section of it. And even then, like pressure is quite indirect and uncertain. Like I'm never told the extent to which. Um, surround pressure from friends and family is going to work for the majority of citizens councils. For those reasons, we also end up voting up on accountability. Third then, we get the idea about insulation from political corruption. And I think here, um, Gov has a lot of material on why politicians are quite crap. And also that counter lobbying mechanisms are incredibly difficult, um, which is why in the status quo, legislatures are highly corrupt and biased. So I think the response we get from op, I think, flies. And it's the idea that if it's the true that governments are so awful, then it's unclear why the citizens that they're appointing and choosing, especially given the prop framing that we are going to be selective about who is on these citizens councils, are going to be immune from these political pressures. They give us examples of gerrymandering. Um, and it's also probably the case that the government also exerts pressure via the grassroots education programs um, that P2 talks about. Um, I think that the claim, I think it's still like not super clear the extent to which this is worse than what prop tells us in terms of political corruption because it is more indirect. So for those reasons, I do still think that political corruption is worse on negative side. Um, however, I just think that this third axis, even though Gov wins it, is not impacted and weighed in comparison to representation and accountability. And it's difficult for me to award them with a win for the principle, um, given that this impact is not really quantified. I'm not given a sense of like how important this is, what the what the difference is um, in terms of insulation and political corruption. And so for those reasons, I still end up giving the whole clash overall to Neg. I will point out that one of my panelists credited the opposition claims on um, these people are going to be appointed by a corrupt government much more 
stronger than I did. Um, and it was because they also believed that the prop benefits on ex on like this is exclusively important on controversial issues relied on the government then choosing to implement these citizens councils own when they're when these issues are actually controversial and they bought the response from neg that if it's controversial and the government doesn't want to do anything then they won't um so just flagging that my panelists um thought that this was important okay so second clash then which is about how they will make decisions so two things here the first is on the idea about representation just because a ton of gov was about how these decisions will be de facto better because even if politicians know more about how to make laws that they are still going to be bad because they aren't aware of the realities on the ground um i think again um the fact that opposition wins this clash on representation means that they also win this dimension the practical dimension of representation as well then second of all on the idea that these laws are highly technically um, complicated and that you need highly um, trained people with economics PhDs in order to make these um, decisions. So I think a couple of claims here. The first thing is I think that the I think that the criticism from Neg that the education programs from Gov and the advising etc is likely to be imperfect is probably true. However, it's also just like deeply unclear to me the extent to which the the citizens councils will be in charge of implementation. Um, as opposed to like just making decisions about what they would prefer in theory. So like, I believe you that they're going to be technically less trained and less like quote unquote intelligent. Um, I don't think that this is terminalized properly and I don't get a clear picture of what the actual changes for policy on the ground. Um, so yeah, I probably buy that OP wins this clash. I don't think it's hugely important. And I think that OP also gives a lot of weighing for why accountability and the principle matters more than debate. Um, so for those reasons, I end up voting neg on the debate overall. Finally, just really briefly on the prop extension, which I think is fairly decently built out um, on grassroots engagement. Um, I think it's good. I think that the criticism from Neg that it's going to be an avenue for political manipulation probably stands. Um, I do still think that the prop benefit of people become more political engaged also still stands. It's just that it's never impacted or weighed to the point that it becomes a voting issue at all. So even though prop probably gets some traction on political engagement, um, this is insufficient for them to win over the idea about representation in general. And for those reasons, Neg takes a win. Are there any questions? Uh, none, we're good. Okay. Um, great, thank you. I encourage you guys to reach out for feedback and best of luck in future rounds.